there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Route 66, the legendary highway 4,000 kilometers long. From Chicago to Los Angeles, America's former main motorway is built from nostalgia and legend. A place of dreams and for adventure. This is the heart of America with its people, their daily lives and their stories. Route 66 is truly America's Main Street. This is where it all begins, Chicago, underneath the city's elevated railway. Route 66 emerged in the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, an era of absolute faith in progress. It starts at a landmark of capitalism. Chicago Board of Trade. At 9 a.m. sharp, the world's largest futures exchange comes to life. This is the center of deals and speculation for all commodities that America's heartland has to offer. Grain, soy, beef, pork or orange juice. It was Chicago that once financed the conquest of the American West and its treasures are still traded here today. So it's no coincidence that the ground for America's first major roadway was broken here over 80 years ago. Chicago, America's Midwestern metropolis on the banks of Lake Michigan, then and now a place full of promise and cliches. A magnet for both honest and unscrupulous entrepreneurs, where fortune seekers become magnets overnight, only to lose it all the next day. Chicago is a vibrant mix of all different cultures, with people taking on various jobs across different sections of society. Chicago is there's so much variety. There's so much of all parts of the world, more than any city, and I've been in all cities in the world. There's so much variety in Chicago. It's a collective of different cultures. You can eat Polish food in a neighborhood where people don't even speak English. You can eat German food and have Wiener schnitzel where they don't even speak English at all. And you don't even know how to order it, you might get the wrong thing, but it's gonna be authentic. And you can, and there's no such thing as real authentic Chicago, I think, except for blues. Marty Sammons grew up as the son of Irish immigrants here in Chicago's rough southwest side. His African-American neighbors played jazz and blues, the music that Marty now tours the country with, driving along Route 66 whenever he can. You go out to Route 66, that's a perfect path. You couldn't choose a better path than to follow Route 66 to get a good idea of American food, American culture, and American music, and American people. This is also where our journey of discovery begins. And so we leave Chicago and set off on this legendary highway. Once America's main transport artery, today Route 66 is a normal road off the beaten track running through Chicago's endless suburbs and nearby small towns. The city of Joliet. 
made famous by the Blues Brothers. From 1926 until the late 1960s, Route 66 was America's mother road, as it was christened by author John Steinbeck. Then, four-lane interstates took over as the main transport roads. In 1984, the name Route 66 was deleted from the US road directory. The once mighty highway was relegated to back road status. Motels, restaurants and petrol stations lost their clientele, falling victim to the progress they once heralded. What remained were ghost towns of the automobile age. Few businesses survived. The cozy dog is one that did. Hi. Hi. Two corn dogs, small fries. Cozy dogs. Cozy dogs. This is a classic American diner. Small fries, uh, small fry. a cheese sauce, and a medium drink, please. For here? Yes, please. Its founder, Ed Wildmeyer Jr., is said to have invented the corn dog in the 40s, a hot dog wiener in a cornbread jacket on a stick. Ed patented this tasty treat as the cozy dog and opened a restaurant on Route 66. To this day, his family has resisted the temptation to create a restaurant chain. And so Josh, Ed's grandson, continues to fry up his grandfather's unique speciality exclusively here on Route 66. What's fascinating about Route 66 is it's a piece of American history that now being so popular is being very well preserved. Uh, today, when you, most people travel on the highways, they, you know, they see McDonald's after McDonald's and Walmart after Walmart, and they never really see the people or meet the people or get a feel for the areas. What was unique about Route 66 was the road went right through the town, so you would really get a sense of where you were. Institutions like the Cozy Dog are Route 66 trademark, where America is both at home and open for the world to see. A group of bikers called Club Monaco arrives at the petrol station next door. They have organized a motorcycle tour down Route 66, saddled up on the vehicles that most characterize its legendary past. J'entends le nom de la route 66, mais une énorme histoire. C'est une passion d'abord. C'est une passion, la passion de la route 66, passion de, de la moto, tout ça réuni. Voilà. Et, et ça nous amène tous ici. Peut-être ça consiste en tout ça, en toute cette diversité, cette musique, c'est l'impression de ne pas savoir ce qu'on va trouver au détour d'un chemin, de découvrir toujours d'autres choses. C'est peut-être ça qui fait le mythe. Cette, cette façon d'avoir un condensé des états unis sur une seule route. On n'a jamais l'impression de pouvoir réaliser ce, ce rêve. C'est vrai que c'est un rêve pour les puristes. Donc euh, on se dit mais on est là, on y est. C'est magnifique, c'est magique. <rire> Faire de la moto, ça apporte de la liberté, ça vide l'esprit et ne plus penser à rien, faire le vide total. Et ce matin, j'ai roulé sur cette route 66 et c'était waouh, merveilleux. We continue along Route 66 through Illinois to Springfield, the state capital. Billy Shear is nearly 90 years old. He has seen the glory days of Route 66 as well as its decline. Billy and his son Billy Jr. are perfect examples of what many business operators along Route 66 experienced. The introduction of the interstate stole their customers. Back then, Billy began collecting disused vintage petrol pumps. 
Years later, his museum developed into an attraction for tourists seeking nostalgia, drawn in by the Forgotten Highway's romantic symbolism and its iconic status for bikers, retracing the footprints of Easy Rider. Since then, Billy has kept everything that visitors from all over the world have left him. Billy is particularly proud of the handmade model he himself has built of his original Route 66 petrol station. He took over the station right after returning from his service in World War II. I stayed there till 55 and then I moved to this building. So that's where I started. So that's how I got started in the gas business. This magazine. Hmm. And this one here. Yeah. That was 64 years ago. Since then, things in Billy's world have changed dramatically. Right after the war, you couldn't get tires, you couldn't get new cars. But now, like I said a while ago, people drive 150 miles for a bowl of chili. How about that sign there? Seven gallon for a dollar. Now it's more like seven dollars a gallon. So I've seen the gas coming from practically nothing to over four dollars. But if it was five dollars, people would buy it. People don't walk nowhere no more. And then this is our guest book. Well, Billy's story. guest book lists visitors from 86 different countries throughout the world. But oh yeah, we get them from England, Germany. But selling something is not the point here. Instead, this place is about pride in the local history and maintaining the heritage of the legendary motorway that runs right in front of the door. A journey along Route 66 is a journey back in time, a nostalgic undertaking almost 4,000 kilometers long. It is a glimpse of an America that no longer exists. Route 66 is an icon of an era, a time when the technical progress symbolized by the automobile had not yet fallen from grace. Monuments from America's golden age of the automobile line the road. They wait beside the old highway for the opportunity to once again fulfill a dream. These are America's classic cars, the mighty machines that once reigned over Route 66. These halls may look like a museum, but in fact they house an entire fleet of street cruisers that are in top shape and ready to roll. Russ Noel covers up to 1,000 miles a week in his search for well-preserved antique cars. Well, that's a different party one. He's bringing that in tomorrow. Oh, okay. Russ and his wife Anita used to run a farm until they started up this business 15 years ago. They sold their 600 pigs and turned their grain fields into a dealership. We grew from about 50 cars to over 500, close to 600 today. So it's really, uh, we've had a lot of fun at it, traveling around and buying cars and meet a lot of nice people. And uh, it's kind of a hobby that we turned into a business, so that makes it fun yet. Yeah. Russ doesn't fix up any of the cars. Buyers have to satisfy themselves with a look under the bonnet and a test drive. These cars are bought and sold as is. Yeah. This is a easier life for us. We farmed, you know, all of our young married life, and that's hard work. 
We worked hard hours, late hours, and it's nice that at whatever stage in our life, I was around 42 and he was about probably 54 or so, that's a good time to leave that real hard work behind and to have come into a business that we both enjoy and, and um, can still make a nice living. Tim McBride has been along for the ride from the beginning. Tim is the company's mechanic, continuing his father's tradition who owned a garage on Route 66. This is a 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air, one of my favorites. It's an all original 283 cubic inch V8 motor, how they came when they were brand new. These halls are Tim's domain. Peter, this is the Model A, Ford Model A. This is what started everything over in this country. And that's the original motor. Runs very good. Step up here. Instead of a boot, we have rear seat. <laughs> which I think is pretty neat. <laughs> most, I think it's neat. Most cars back windows don't go all the way up and down, but this one even had a slide back for back here. <laughs> So this is what they used here. Most of them had six cylinders, but this is a straight eight cylinder, which you don't see very often, but they ran real nice and smooth. And you could ride these cars probably 80 mile an hour down the freeway. This 1948 Pontiac Silver Street with an automatic transmission and a car radio is only a little more expensive than a brand new Japanese car. Chrome-adorned veterans have a well-earned reputation as gas guzzlers, but the customers who come here from all over the world don't seem to mind. The Knowles aren't simply selling cars. They're selling a feeling, a dream. Anita is also used to receiving inquiries from another well-known industry that sells people dreams every day. Well, and we had 12 cars shipped to Connecticut for the very last Harrison Ford uh, Indiana Jones movie. And we were pretty excited about that because we don't strive for that. We didn't know, you know, we weren't trying to be in the movies. They came to us, so we were glad. As we are leaving, Russ opens the door to a hidden world a world that many Americans look back to as a better one. Traveling along Route 66, it takes time to find the relics of the early days of the automobile age. Along an old stretch of road, we discover the largely overgrown remnants of John's Modern Cabins, a motel consisting of pioneer-style log cabins built a good 60 years ago. Soon, they will disappear forever. Not everyone you meet along Route 66 is a tourist in search of nostalgia. Master Sergeant Michael Ross is an Illinois state trooper whose duties sometimes put him on the old motorway running alongside the interstate. He tells us that the virtually abandoned road is a temptation for many to ignore the speed limit. And it's not long after we join him that he has to intervene. His radar shows 63 miles per hour here, where the speed limit is 55. The blinking lights in the mirror signal to the driver to pull over immediately. In this situation, only the police officer is permitted to leave his vehicle. Hi, ma'am. Hi. Hi, Master Sergeant Ross with the state police. The reason I pulled you over is you were going 62 miles an hour and the speed limit here is 55. Okay. Do you have any reason you were speeding? Okay. I just lost track of my speed. Okay, can I see your driver's license and your insurance card, please? 
It's an expensive misdemeanor at $120, and although Erin Watts is allowed to continue on her way, the police force will keep her driving license until she pays. Anyone traveling along Route 66 who comes into contact with the police should bear a few rules of conduct in mind. Pull over on the shoulder, kind of keep your hands up by the steering wheel so there's no sudden movements, like somebody's gonna to try to get a gun or a weapon. Um, even though a lot of people try to grab their license real quick, just make sure any movements you do are slow. And keep your hands where we can see them and we'll ask for the documents that we want. We'll ask for your driver's license. Just go slowly and say it's in the glove box so the officer knows that you're gonna open up the glove box to get the rental agreement or insurance card or whatever it might be. State troopers like Michael Ross work long days in which they travel great distances. For the troopers, much has changed over the years as well, but not their favorite meeting spot. Chester, how are you? This is the Luca Pizzeria in Bloomington. Lieutenant Chester Henry is here so often he's almost a part of the furniture. Lieutenant Henry was close to retirement when rookie trooper Michael joined him as his new partner. That was more than 20 years ago. On old Route 66, the intersections were where the problems were, all across the roads, all crossed across there. And some out along the road you had accidents, but the majority of them, we had an accident uh, map with the pins we used to put pins in, and black pins were for fatals, and, or red pins maybe were, and yellow pins and white pins, depending on what kind of accident. And they would just be a blob, you know, at each intersection. That's why most of us like Route 66. That's where the action was. Lieutenant Henry has a photo album of car accidents from 25 years of service on Route 66. The junction-free interstate was opened in the 1960s. But probably cut down on the accidents and the undertakers didn't make so much. And all funeral homes used to run the ambulances. You know, they, they, would, they wouldn't get paid after they'd go out and make a run. Nobody would ever pay them but, uh, unless they got the funeral or something, if it was a fatal. You know. Michael and Chester have more to talk about today in their favorite diner. But we have to head back out along Route 66 on our journey westwards. A few miles later, we meet Carol Stuffle. It's Friday evening in Litchfield, Illinois. That's the trash. And just like it has been every weekend from May to September for over 50 years, her first customers show up long before the show itself begins. Entry to the Skyview Theater costs all of $6. That's per car, including a rubbish bag. Route 66 was once adorned with 47 drive-in movie theaters. Today, only eight remain. In the 1950s, their main attractions, aside from the movies, were the love lanes, secluded parking areas for couples. Today, Americans appreciate the casual communal experience at Ozoners, as they call the drive-in theaters nowadays. Spectators can grab a bite to eat whenever they like, or simply wait for the next film, because tonight, as usual, the program features two films. But the Skyview Drive-In is also in danger now. Its owner is over 90 years old, and he has no interest in investing in a new and expensive digital projection system. Once the film distributors no longer offer their films on celluloid, the Skyview property may well be replaced by a shopping mall. The next morning, we reach the mighty Mississippi River, formerly known to the native Indian population as the father of waters. 
At the riverbanks, one finds the remnants of Cahokia, at one time the largest indigenous American settlement north of Mexico. This UNESCO World Heritage Site is filled with the settlement's many mounds and temples. Monk's Mound is Cahokia's most famous landmark. What would daily life have been like for Cahokia's roughly 20,000 residents? Archaeologists have attempted to create a reconstruction in the site's museum. But there are no written records on what is officially known as the Mississippi culture. One day a year, the museum hosts its archaeology day. Larry Muller and his daughter Anne Cicero are among the growing member of Americans who are deeply interested in the people who inhabited the ground beneath their feet long ago. The archaeologists on site provide information on the age and the origins of all the artifacts that are found. Most of the artifacts came from my property and it's I don't know, it gives me such a great sense of history to be able to walk out onto my property and scour the grounds and find things like this and know that someone 9,500 years ago picked this up and used it. It's a feeling like you, 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 could, you could be there with them a little bit, you know, and you wish you could, but <laughs> I, I really would like to know how in the world they managed to kill anything with those primitive tools that they had and how, they, you know, getting something to eat must have been a terrible job back then. This is a matate. It has the smooth and grind bowl type. And that was what they were to put their corn, their maize, whatever grain they had. They would use a mano to grind it. The Mississippi culture collapsed 200 years before the arrival of Europeans here. At present, no one can explain why Cahokia was abandoned or where its residents migrated to. Since 1929, Route 66 has crossed the Mississippi River here at the Chain of Rocks Bridge. Once regarded as a pioneering technological breakthrough, only a few years ago it was scheduled to be demolished. Today the Chain of Rocks is a national architectural monument and a popular pedestrian bridge. St. Louis was the starting point for the fabled covered wagons that set off to conquer the American West. The Gateway Arch is a monument to these courageous pioneers. This metropolis on the Mississippi is a city undergoing change. Dragon! Dragon people! Sophia! Cinco de Mayo, the 5th of May, is an annual holiday celebrated here by the city's Latin American residents. Let's shock over there with the orange stripes. You guys walk after that. But in St. Louis, it is also a day of celebration for the city's alternative scene. On this day, the streets in this part of town are transformed into a stage for local clubs and organizations from the area. This is a typically traditional American parade. The holiday is also a demonstration of a city's determination to survive in the face of unprecedented decline over the last 50 years. Michael Allen participates in the parade as a member of the local Volvo Classic Car Club. How's it going? The people in this neighborhood know each other well. These houses are built a lot by German-American craftsmen. Um, 
this neighborhood was pretty strong into the 20th century and started declining after World War II. The whole city declined. A lot of people moved out of the city. We lost over half our population. Michael is a freelance cultural heritage conservator, and he knows the changes that have occurred in this area like no one else. Well, African Americans moved in, in the 60s and 70s, and then in the late 80s and early 90s, we had a lot of Mexicans coming in the neighborhood, and they opened uh, small businesses. In the last like five or six years, art, a lot of artists have discovered this area. And so we have well over a dozen art galleries and arts-related small businesses. So the neighborhood is reinventing itself with small businesses, it's not, not with factories, not with big jobs. And, and it's all happening slowly, organically. Like many others, Michael Allen made the decision to move from the monotony of the suburbs into this part of St. Louis. That's how we do it, this is a celebration of urban pioneers looking to create a different America, one entrenched in its roots that is not afraid to roll up its sleeves and get things done. Together with Michael, we set off on an expedition into a bygone era. America's industrial age. St. Louis is a symbol of dramatic economic change unlike any other American city. This was once a tinned meat factory and part of a massive complex of abattoirs. The machine shop was shut down 50 years ago and simply left to deteriorate. At the peak, Armour was uh, slaughtering, um, I think the estimate was uh, 50,000 cattle and uh, 30,000 pigs every day here. There was 4,500 people here, uh, and each of the other plants had at least 2,000 people, and the stockyards themselves employed uh, close to uh, 3,000 people. So there were over 10,000 people here every day working. You know, and this was a 24-hour place. They were, they were working all day and all night to keep up with America's demand. The rise of the deep freezer meant the fall of the tinned meats industry. Virtually all of the traditional industrial branches fell victim to technological and political change. The manufacturing that also made East St. Louis and this region so big, they're not necessarily in the United States anymore. Uh, St. Louis was a major center for, uh, you know, steel and metal industry, and that's mostly in China right now. Uh, a lot of other manufacturing is in China, uh, India, other parts of the world. We wander for hours through these places. These are the archaeological research sites of tomorrow. This is where the people once lived who worked in the St. Louis factories. Entire city districts have been abandoned. This urban decline provides the bleak background for the boom in the city's cultural scene. St. Louis is a major center for hip-hop music. When night falls, the club scene awakens. Gramophone is one of many popular hotspots. Hip-hop is no longer a ghetto culture phenomenon in St. Louis. Rapper Tef Po describes his music as the opportunity to overcome the barriers of ignorance and racism. I feel like I make realistic music. A lot of rappers focus on one particular aspect of uh, hip-hop and they make that their thing. 
I just try to do it all. And I don't want to be cliche with that because in rap, everybody thinks that their story is unique. So I try to put a unique spin on that, you know, tell you specific things from my childhood, you know, things that I did. I just make a realistic reflection of who I am. Tef Poe is part of a new, confident generation of rappers who no longer rely on macho attitude, fancy cars, and flashy gold chains. In my neighborhood, the rappers would imitate the drug dealers in my neighborhood. The rappers didn't really live like that, but they would imitate that. And then I think nowadays it's the reverse, the, 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 the drug dealers are imitating the rappers. So, you know, like, it's a role reversal. So, but it, that goes to show you how the power of the music has dictated, you know, where we're at as a society. In love with myself, let it expand. His song, In Love With Myself, tells us that life is hard, but that ultimately you will overcome your problems if you can just believe in and accept yourself. Just outside of St. Louis, another world begins. This hilly landscape in southern Missouri is called the Ozarks. It's like an American picture book dream. H.K. and Judy Sylvie have been married for 56 years. Their families have lived in the Ozarks for generations. For decades, H.K. worked on the Saturn rockets that took America's astronauts to the moon. Then they bought this farm where they raised four children. According to H.K. and Judy, Nothing but death itself could drag them away from here. So this is my uh, part of it. It's part of it back yonder, but this, this over here, all this that you can see cleared belongs to me. 130 hectares, 70 head of cattle. That's enough to live from, says H.K. What life is about. It ain't about how much money you can make and, and how big a fine house you can live in. It's about helping and loving your neighbor. You know, to have neighbors, you have to be a neighbor. I've moved, moved 21 times and in 19 years, and I've lived in 13 states, and nowhere have I found people like they are here. They're people that you can trust, they're people that, that will stand by you, they're people that will help you if you need help. H.K. and Judy needed this help when their oldest son was killed in an accident and Judy suffered a stroke shortly afterwards. She was a city girl. She could not imagine how anyone could make a living on the farm. And it was hard. It was hard, but we were working for ourselves. We wasn't working for the other man. And at 78 years of age, H.K. heads out just like he has for all the years before to drive 45 minutes through the hills of the Ozarks where the pioneering spirit of his ancestors can still be felt.
Here at this junction, we see what was once a post office and general store. Hello! Bluegrass jam sessions are a tradition in the Ozarks. These get-togethers go back beyond living memory and find the men enjoying what the women have cooked up, with everyone trading the latest news and, most important of all, making music. In his earlier life, HK got to know all of the country's musical trends. He has always played music on his fiddle that his uncle gave him as a gift at the age of 11. These tunes are the same tunes that our great-grandfathers played. Great, great, great. And probably just about the same way that they played them. Uh, it just come right on down through the the generations that we play them and, uh, a lot. Do you read music? No, I don't. I don't read music. You don't read music. You don't. Do you read music? No. Our generation don't read any music at all. And yet, people like this one here will have repertoires of three and four hundred tunes in their mind. <laughs> yeah, they just, everybody's different. Okay. For instance, we're going to play in a G chord, so I'm going to start out right on a G string. Immigrants from Scotland and Ireland brought this music here in the 17th century, and the tradition has been passed down ever since at jam sessions like this one. Bluegrass, the way it's played here, is music without lyrics. The fiddle and the fiddler not only tell the story, they also dictate the rhythm for the square dancing. come here are the salt of the earth. They are the salt of the earth. Yeah. They're, they're my friends and everybody else's. You see all them pictures up there. Most of them are fiddlers that have already gone on. They were coming here and we're what's left. That's what it's all about. Friends and getting together and having a good time. That's what it's all about. And soon we return to our journey on Route 66, further westwards, where the Great Plains and the land of the cowboys await us.